I'm Claudio. I, I work um, with interaction design in AI, but today I'm going to talk to you about a VR game I worked on last year. And uh, we're going to talk about uh, UX. I, for this game, I cover the role of principal UX designer. Uh, just for clarity, it's not going to be about UI UX, but it's more like the type of experience that's around how the user, how the player is going to use uh, their hands around the environment and like, in the game. Uh, so it's a concept which is more akin to what some people start, like, like calling spatial computing and things like this. And um, so I'm like, uh, also going to talk about how to use some theories from cognitive science to actually make these interactions and those experiences more engaging and more compelling. So the game is called In Death. Uh, it's a VR game. It's an Icelandic production. It's been produced in Iceland uh, by a studio called Solfar. And we, like, we, with the help of RBX Special Effects Studio, we're all based in Iceland. And it's been re um, released across the major uh, VR platforms, like Rift, um, Vive, and PlayStation VR. It's uh, a dungeon crawler. Uh, classical concept. It's based in the afterlife, so you are in this environment, there's like a lot of creatures that try to get rid of you, and you, you've you been like equipped with a weapon and a shield uh, to make your, like, your way through it. There's no specific goal, you just have to survive, and you have to go through the game until like you reach the final boss, and eventually like you win it, and then you start the game again, but this time it's more difficult. So. Um, you have to survive it. The concept is like uh, pretty classical. What makes it different, what makes it unique is the fact that it's immersive. It's using VR, so you are immersed into this action. What does that mean? It means, for example, that you don't have a button for strafing and dodging projectiles. You literally have to lean left or right with your body uh, to avoid incoming, incoming threats. Or you can use like, part of the environment to hide yourself, get cover, and like, you know, gain, gain some tactical advantage. It also means that you don't move the camera smoothly. You, like, we rely on teleportation, like many other like, VR titles, uh, for comfort reasons. Uh, what we did here, though, like for this game, was to try to fit the teleportation into the narrative of the game and uh, like giving the player a special arrow that you can shoot with the bow uh, that like, is going to teleport you to a certain destination, which is the point where the arrow landed. Uh, the game is uh, designed to be uh, very hard. So there was a conscious choice uh, of the design, which is good because it allows a certain amount of replayability of the game if the player really gets into the challenge. But most importantly, I think it's pushing the player to actually achieve uh, mastery uh, of the weapons, mastery of like, marksmanship into using the bow and become really good at handling the weapon and becoming better and better since it's so, like, the game is so hard, the only way to make it through is to become like, really accurate with the shooting. But also understanding architecture and understanding like, um, like what, what could be a way to actually gain a tactical advantage by leveraging on like, the shape of buildings and, and how things are laid out in the environment. Uh, also like, by using teleportation like, in a smart way. So uh, like this idea of, of, uh, uh, of mastery of the weapons requires an attentive uh, design of the interaction of how the person, of how the player interacts with this, um, like with this object. So as I said at the beginning, I worked on uh, like designing the handle interactions for this VR game, which in a game like this uh, mostly means uh, the way in which the player handles the weapons. Because this is a type of like end manipulation that the person's going to go through uh, very often, uh, like on a second to second basis, uh, especially in combat situations, the action becomes really frantic and has to actually be able to control those weapons and handle those weapons accurately and have a sense of control. So definitely, like the functionalities of these weapons have to be there. You have to have like the player, like we want you to have the player uh, experience a sense, a sense of becoming better and better at using those objects. But was also important to nail like a certain kind of fun, so an engagement, like designing the interactions so that they were like engaging and they were like a, an intense experience of, of, of like combat-like uh, visual experiences. Uh, designing weapons for VR is different than designing weapons for, uh, for games. And it's important to understand why. It's important to understand where really lies the difference here. So if you go on YouTube and you search for a video of a game or a VR game, you hardly see the differences between the two. If you're looking at what's happening in the virtual world, they kind of almost look like the same. But the big difference really 
like uh, lies when you actually look at the people. What people do when they actually play these experiences, it's completely different. In games, the posture is like quite static and usually seated. But what's important about it is that like, you're holding like a device with buttons and like what you actually move is just your thumbs. And that's like the beginning of your interaction. Something meaningful happens when you move your thumbs on the button and like whatever is meaningful, it's a feedback that gets like bounced back to you through the screen. So the person keeps looking um, at the screen continuously. So the head is fixed. In VR instead, um, there's like a, a way larger set of movement that like a person do when as in this, when it's like inside these experiences. Uh, people can be standing uh, or like moving around. Uh, but most importantly, there is no screen. Uh, the display is attached in your head and you can like literally move your head around that like plays a big difference in the interactive experience. And also like you uh, like move your hands for uh, like performing certain interactions uh, in the environment around you. So there's a big, di like, big difference in terms of experience here. Um, so like, like, like what's, what's like really different, uh, what's really different about the two, if we think about it, uh, is the motion space that we allow uh, to the person. So like in games, which are interactive experiences, uh, we have a very small motion space that's allowed to the players. Like, like you move the times over the buttons and things are happening. Compared to other type of like interactive experiences, for example, like, you know, face-to-face -face social interactions. Not the kind of social interactions we do on Facebook, but face-to-face. -face. Uh, it's still an interactive experience. It's still like something interactive that we do with others, which is meaningful, but it requires the use of our entire body. I think of body language, for example. I mean, you can rely on uh, like the entire spectrum of movements that your body allows to actually, um, to actually like, uh, like make meanings with others. What does VR lies uh, in these pictures? Like something in the middle. So the, the, like the movement space is like larger compared to the one of games. But you know, is this, is this actually like lending itself to the same experiences? Like having, having, having like, uh, like the player being able to move more, uh, does it mean that we can actually think of those games uh, in VR in the same way in which we think games in the screen? So like the practices and the guidelines are really the same. VR games tend to be more kinesthetic because of this. And, and like, um, uh, like the fact that we have a larger box uh, is not obviously like a better or an increment in the experience. It needs to be leveraged uh, in the proper way. So like back to the weapons, like if we now we have those type of um, uh, like larger space of body movements which allow to the player and uh, can manipulate uh, things with, uh, like with their hands, um, like, uh, how are we going to design those weapons? Like, of, like, obviously, the guidelines that we use for games might not actually quite fit here because we have, like, you know, the player moving hands and manipulating and handling those weapons correctly. So, like, like how can we do that? We need to think differently. We need to think about uh, affordances. Uh, we need to think about, like, how those objects are shaped and what kind of forms they have so that they can actually uh, inform a person how to use them properly. So affordances are important. Like good design is invisible, but bad design is like pretty obvious. When the affordances are not working for us, uh, you, can, you can see it right away. So like affordances are important to actually need the functionalities of those objects that for us are the weapons that we focused on. But like, um, how can we connect this to the fun? And that's where it came the cognitive science. Like central to the design process that I follow on, uh, was the idea of uh, embodied cognition. So it's typical to think that the mind affects the body. With embodied cognition, we allow ourselves to think that like, body movements affect our thinking. So for example, we can look at uh, what happens with dancers. Like dancers, uh, they, like, they learn choreographies to actually perform uh, and like, make, make, make a performance. Like learning a choreography takes a long time. Um, it's like quite complex in terms of like, you know, motor coordinations and everything. Uh, but they actually develop a trick. They have a technique called marking that they use to learn choreographies uh, much faster. So marking, uh, it's not doing the choreography, it's kind of like sketching the choreography, like performing movements that kind of like mimics the choreography without really putting the full energy into it. 
And, and that's like the way in which they learn choreography is like much faster. They, 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 by moving their body, they actually influence their learning. In fact, we, we can actually see some research done by uh, David Kirsch uh, that's been looking at the way in which dancers are performing those markings and like performing those like movements for uh, facilitating their learning. And that's exactly what I found out, that by kind of mimicking the choreography, uh, they were able to actually learn it much faster than doing the choreography like full out, full force, or even just like thinking about the choreography. So like what turned out that was helping them was like mimicking the movements, help them like to actually build a temporal model or a like mental image of, of what, what, um, what the choreography would have been, like kind of like uh, lay itself out in time and space and how to coordinate with others. So the idea here that we had was like to leverage the same, like the same concept and think about like what is the choreography uh, that the player is doing when he's actually moving her hands around those weapons? Uh, what is the performance that like, the player is actually doing? And the idea here is that like, the performance is a role model. It's a hero character. Um, and like, um, uh, so it's not only, so the player is not only just like, operating those uh, weapons, but it's also kind of like, as it does that, it, it, like, it moves in ways uh, if you design like the weapons in a certain way, you make like the player moves in ways that it's kind of like enacting a character, enacting like a certain a certain like uh, hero role model, uh, which is like an idea akin to this like marking the dancers do, and and like you know role playing it's fun. So central to our design process really was like how can we make uh, role playing out of end movements? How can we design or think of like the way in which the player moves his hands around those objects in such a way that that becomes like an act of role playing. So overall, the picture was something like this: design affordances uh, for those objects that makes move, like that makes like you know, the, like a person operate those those uh, those um, uh, like weapons in the best way, and. Uh, like the interaction with the weapons elicit like sort of the movements. The movements is acting out. Uh, it's like similar to acting out like the hero, the hero characters. But at the same time, it reinforces the idea of like performing really well or performing like on top of certain um, like out of the ordinary like, like through those weapons. Um, so like making the affordances um, for the objects, it, it, like it was it was like you know really important. We needed to make those affordances really well. And like the, first, like the first approach, the first temptation would be to actually copy the affordances from the real objects and translate them into the virtual world. That doesn't work out of the box. Like the reason why it doesn't work out of the box is because we all kind of understood this, like, you know, the vision of VR, this idea of a vivid dreaming, um, like some kind of like manufactured reality where we impact the senses. Uh, but like the, reality, like the virtual reality we have now, the assets we have now, they allow also to do like, a minor reality, a minor version of this vision. So the question really becomes like, how do you project like real objects into this minor reality that we have at our disposal? Uh, but because objects and affordances are really meant for the human body, the deeper question becomes, how do you see the human body projected into this minor reality? Because we need to understand that in order to make affordances for this. And that's the way in which we look that's the way in which the human body looks inside, um, like minor reality. It's a VR homunculus uh, with a head and two ears and not even eyes. They are actually kind of binocular holes, which are quite different. And, and we don't even have ends. We have like some kind of a punching gloves in there, and that's like makes a big difference in terms of affordances because not having fingers, not having palms, it uses a lot of our ability to explore our surroundings. So the real question becomes. When you think about like making anything that's like any interactions in VR, how do you design an object for this creature? See, because if you think about like objects that we in real life, those are designed for our body, but now we have an embodiment which is different. How do you design an object for this creature? How do you find out? But the only way for us, or at least like in our approach, um, the way that we actually move forward uh, was surprise prototypes. You are just have to fast prototypes as fast as you can. Um, like make as many prototypes as you can to actually get a sense of what responds, what works for this VR homunculus. But also very important to use user testing as soon as possible. Like prototypes alone is 
like it tells you only up to a point. You need to see other persons like jumping on board with those prototypes and see how far they go with that. It's important to prototype. Like I, 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 I experience that it's important to prototype as soon as possible, uh, not too early. Like you know, bad ideas. It's like bad to be adjust them. So our approach was like to kind of like user test internally and then like open up to other user testers. But like fast prototyping, it's been instrumental. Um, it's been important for us also to think of these weapons like props, um, like in the same way in which like you know uh, stage designers or like people that work in theater things about props for actors, uh, objects that are not really meant to work in certain ways, but like to kind of like suggest or elicit a certain way to act around them. And what also we found out was uh, uh, tremendously valuable. Uh, the prototypes became a communication tool inside the team. It was the best way to talk about VR interactions for us. Like sometimes it's kind of like complicated to talk about like what will happen in VR, and like you might write down, you might have pictures or animations. Sometimes nothing really works. You just have to have actual prototypes within the actual VR space where you see how things are unfolding. So let's look at the bow and let's look how the real bow translates into a bow for the VR molecules. How does the object change? So a real bow, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's an elegant minimal design, but it's also quite sophisticated. Uh, it's a number of parts which are important for us to actually handle it properly. Uh, there is a grip, uh, there is um, a harrow rest, which is like where you place the harrow. More importantly, there is like a serving, that, that area that you see over there. I don't know if you can see the pointer, but there's like an area there where, where you can actually like grab like the string to pull it back. Um, like that part, which is like actually quite thin in reality, in virtual reality it became thick and really, really long, as long as a string. So it became kind of like barked up. Uh, instead of having like a grip, we have to replace that with an attach point, something that gets attached to your hand. And something really important, because the VR monkeys doesn't have really eyes, they have like two these bino like binocular holes, uh, we have to cut short and like make the hero appear as soon as you grab like the knocking, like the knocking area. Because that was helping like the person to have a straight line of sight. Because we wanted to actually have the person to actually achieve this idea of like, you know, becoming better and becoming a master of shooting like accurately. So like that, that, like, that really like helped to, to like to keep this like straight line of sight. As much as was helping, um, the other idea that we had to do, um, it was like constraining certain worst orientation. Like, like there are ways of twisting your, your, like your hands that like, have been disabled where you actually control the bow uh, so that like the hero get placed into line of sight which is constant. So you constantly get reminded of what's like your line of sight. You can actually get into flow of using this bow quite fast and quite quickly. Um, the final result was something that uh, lends itself to be used in combat situations. Uh, also like when there's kind of like a frantic moment and like uh, the player can actually shoot accurately, can get a sense of like becoming better, a bit more accurate, but it can also do like stuff that you wouldn't do with a real bow, for example, shooting horizontally. That's something that like, it's connected this idea of like enacting the use of an object so that you think like you are a hero. And uh, that was like uh, pretty much what we did um, like for the bow. It was important also to kind of like uh, keep a consistent uh, interaction and I could like, like design the object so that like the player could keep a consistent rhythm of, of the interaction. And that's like pretty much what we did like for the bow uh, in short. Uh, for the crossbow, uh, it's a little bit more like more complicated because the crossbow is like more recent as an object. There are like many different variants. So we went into archives of uh, like museums and uh, some other connections I have in Italy uh, to actually study like different variants, different crossbows and understand like the various mechanics and like, like what was the advantage of others compared to others. Uh, like in general, that, like the idea of the crossbow was like, you know, be able to load a bolt like fast. So fast firing was like like, like, you know, the reasons why they were invented. Um, like, um, in my research, I also find something uh, quite interesting. I discovered that, like, Leonardo da Vinci, uh, like, prototyped uh, a crossbow, but just, like, on paper. It was never realized. But it was, like, an automatic, uh, like, kind of, like, you know, something you could load quickly. So there's this artisan in Italy who actually made it, uh, this, like, following the blueprint of Leonardo da Vinci. 
And it's a crossbow that is like cut in half. You can open it, and it loads automatically. So the idea was really like rapid firing. What we did like for the crossbow was like to think about like how to fuse all these characteristics of different like crossbows from different like eras, and like try to fuse it into one object that we thought uh, it could be like representative and different from the bow um, in the way to use it. So we went through a number of prototypes, like modular prototypes that we built quite quickly out of gray boxing and like, like modular parts that you can interact with. Uh, we started by having like an handle on top and then looking at people and how they were responding and how much they were getting into the flow. And then we moved the handles to the side just to see like what's the difference, if it was like better for aiming or not. And then we even went as far as like putting some kind of like uh, lever uh, type of interaction here and it, like kept looking at how people were moving and what we're doing. And like the final version uh, is uh, this one over here, uh, where you can uh, grab the string and pull it backwards and like load immediately. So if you come really good at doing this movement, you can actually shoot and like reload it very fast. And then you can also like grab it with two hands and do some more like precision shooting. So that's what, what concerned looking at those objects in the virtual world. But it's interesting to look, as I said at the beginning, to look at how people responded in terms of movement. And this is, actually the marking of like the people mimicking like a certain character through the use of that object. So design the object so that people could move in certain ways when they were actually using it. And uh, it's also important here to actually think about fatigue profiles. Like, like since you design an object that gets used, that, like kind of like, a, you know, make people move in certain ways, you need to think about like what kind of muscles get involved in there and like try to actually make fatigue profiles which are orthogonals between these two different objects. And, and, uh, um, and you can also see how, how um, like the movements are not necessarily the same movements that we would do with the real objects. They're like sketched. Uh, but nevertheless, they are enough to actually build a mental model of what's happening in, uh, in, uh, uh, inside the virtual world and what's happening when they are enacting into those objects. Another thing that we did that was very important was like to parameterize the forensics. Uh, that was like key for us because we didn't have much time to do user testing or like a formal user testing, so we had to go fast. Uh, try to iterate as fast as possible. So like, like what I did was like to organize the affordances into a number of parameters that we could actually tweak and change right after every user testing. So user testing was an occasion to observe people, but also like to mold those values around like what we found out was like more or less comfortable, more or less easy uh, to actually get, uh, like get working for the players when they were like trying this. Um, also, once again, like those parameters helped a lot as a communication tool because it helped, it helped us to have like a meeting where we're like focused on certain ideas and certain concepts. So they really worked as a, a form of like information architecture, like provide us a vocabulary to talk about like what we saw during this uh, like user experiences and like during Louis, like uh, user testing. Um, uh, something that was also very important. Uh, that sometimes get overlooked uh, was active feedback. They would put a lot of effort into trying to actually uh, get it right. Why it's important? Because active feedback is a way to subtle, like highlight uh, like rhythmic pattern of the interaction. Also, like VR tends to be, um, tends to be very loaded, uh, like on the vision, it tends to be like visually very loaded. So to actually provide feedbacks in a subtle side way through vibrations is actually like a good thing. Uh, like, you know, reduces the cognitive load uh, on the person. Uh, but for example, let's, let's look at the bow, at the act of shooting the bow and, and, and how the, the, like the active feedback comes into play uh, to actually define or reinforce the idea of a tempo of the interaction, uh, like, reinforces, um, like reinforcing the idea of a certain rhythm and like getting into a rhythmic pattern as using this object. And like, uh, that's achieved by providing an active feedback in key moment of the interaction. Uh, like when the player uh, touch the string, first you get like a first impulse, then you get like longer one where you grab the strings, then you get like a progressive one when the string gets pulled backward, and then you get a shake. So all of those active feedback are there to actually mark a tempo in time uh, that in turn and gets the person into a repetitive flow of movements and getting into like the repetition of those movements like in a, uh, in a form of uh, aesthetic of interaction. Um, something we didn't realize early on uh, when we started working on, uh, on, 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 on the two weapons, especially because the crossbow as an idea came 
further down into the game, was that like the two, like there's two weapons, like in games when you add a new weapon, it's, it's like you know, adding more to what you already have. Um, like, uh, but like here, it was really about like adding an extra object and also like demanding the person to actually relearn a new set of movements. And because like the handling of the two objects is different. Like the bow is something that, let's say you hold with your left hand and you operate it with your right hand. Uh, the crossbow is the other way around. You hold it with your right hand and you operate it with your left hand. Um, so like when you tend to use one object, you build up the muscle memory of that object. And when you switch to another weapon, the muscle memory doesn't work anymore. You have to relearn it. And, and that's, you know, it's a bit different like from, like from games where like ultimately all the weapons really like, you know, it boils down to pressing buttons, like at least like a sensory motor level. But here it's different. And so, um, like having new weapons like require new conditioning and effort, something that has to be considered that we did not consider at first, but then we kind of like crashed onto it and we had to work around it. Um, but the thing, like the good news was that we found a way to interpret these differences. And instead of looking at them as two different weapons, we started looking at them as two different classes, two different ways of playing the game. So they, they were like two different like gameplay styles. And when we actually started looking in their way, everything became like, uh, in a way, like more productive in a sense that we could see how we could imagine two different communities of players forming out there, one that prefers the bow, another one that prefers the, like the crossbow, and start kind of like uh, uh, comparing each other out in performances uh, around the idea of like designing, like designing uh, objects like in, in a different way. So um, uh, here's what was like where we had to go through a very intense user testing session that was done like remotely, uh, because at that point the game was already in early access, so we could we, we got like a, a few very dedicated players on board. They really wanted to test the new additions, one of which was like the new weapon. And at the beginning they hated it because you know they were like super good at playing the bow, and then suddenly they have to relearn the things from scratch and they didn't like it. Uh, but there wasn't really a way to be able to operate the crossbow the same way in which you operate the bow. It's like they're two different objects. You can't really manipulate them in the same way. So by doing some, something I've never done before, like some uh, uh, like remote user testing through Slack, uh, we were able to actually like, work really well. They were, they were like, incredibly passionate about the game, so they started like, commenting and talking to each other how what works and what not. And that was like, very good for me to keep a track of all those conversations. Uh, and also, like, uh, what was really important was like, asking them to send me a uh, video recording of their play sessions, because it was really hard to understand, or it was really hard to read through what they were actually experiencing. It was important to see what was happening really in the game. Uh, so that was like something I didn't expect to work out, like could it work out, uh, but it worked out pretty well. So just to conclude, um, uh, forget any rules about like practical, practical like uh, tricks or practical like rule of thumbs here. The technology is changing. As the technology is changing, the VR homunculus will look more and more like a person. So the affordances will be different. So here. Like, like what, what's really a takeaway is not about how to do things like in the, in the details, but uh, to keep looking at people and keep looking at how people move. So like not only focus on what's happening on the screen, what's happening in the virtual world, but look what people do, because that's where part of the fun is coming. Part of the fun is coming from like making an experience which is like kinesthetic and fun in a kinesthetic way. So in a sense, like practice dancing, in a sense, like reconnect to your body, like like rediscover what's fun to do with your body in a sense, because that like allows you to connect this idea of like making beautiful experiences through body movement. And that uh, concludes my talk and I'm open for questions, thanks. Yeah. Um, I have a lot of trouble using haptics in VR, and especially when doing the, the up and down modulation that you showed in a graph. Can you share your technique with making that happen? Technique? Yes. So like the graph I showed, it's like um, a very crude representation, yes. yeah. because haptic is like, you know, you have frequencies and, yeah. and amplifications. Um, but what I did uh, was basically having like a, 
a similar approach to um, like motion design. So I, I, made, I made like a way to actually modulate the optics through a couple of parameters. And, and then I tweaked them until I, I, I was getting like a response that I thought was actually good. And then I also create like different categories. There is something that I call like the optic click that it kind of like mimics like a click yep. or it's kind of like a, a soft like rhythmic kind of like a um, uh, feedback. And then another one which is like thicker and longer. I don't really know a better way to describe it. It's a bit like describing sounds. Yeah, yeah. Like thicker and longer. And, and then like uh, that I remember, something that worked really well, uh, it was like the shake on the bow. Like it's an active feedback that just like shakes like this. Like it kind of like gives you the idea of, of like, uh, like, like energy that gets released into the object. Um, but the main concept really that I wanted to show was really try to place it into like key moments of the interaction. Like try to imagine the interaction almost like a dramaturgy and like try to imagine like what could be the point where you want to make an emphasis in the tempo. And that was, that's at least what I found out was like the most effective way to do it. And then of course the user testing. Yeah. Like sometimes I overdid it. I, I put too much of it and it was getting confusing. So as a little time, like in music, it's better to just like be conservative and not add too much on it. Thank you very much. Um, oh, um, how closely did the design of uh, the UX elements that you were just demonstrating uh, tie in with the UI elements? For instance, the, the little bar that you can see on the bow, on the other hand, did you guys experiment with using UI elements that were, um, I guess, more attached to the camera? Was it a, or was it an immediate thought to we're just going to have diegetic UI design and have that as part of the props themselves. Yeah, uh, thanks. That's uh, uh, how to recap on this. This uh, it's been like we 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 didn't want to have uh, UIs on the camera uh, at the beginning, even though I was one of those pushing for it, like to have some of this information on on you know, attached to the camera. Uh, so the health specifically ended up to be. Uh, like in the bow because we kind of wanted to have it visible as you were shooting. Uh, other type of UIs maybe uh, that I didn't have time to cover here was how you actually select the arrows because I didn't mention that you can have like power up arrows and all these kind of things and like you can carry like those arrows like with you in some form of an inventory and, and that was kind of like a more challenging UX UI type of thing because like uh, at some point we tried to work it out in a way that was uh, um, user friendly, let's put it in that way. Try to have it like with smooth animations and everything. But then it really like broke against the fast pacedness of the game. Like when it was getting like really fast paced and when it was getting like really just uh, intense, uh, that was just like in the way. So we stripped it down to something much more basic uh, that like literally appears and disappears. But what we did uh, was to play with time and actually uh, with the time dilation um, because the action can be so frantic and you might feel actually so overwhelmed uh, but everything that happens around you which is kind of threatening um, like we, we, we basically slow down time every time you open any of those you know, UI for selecting like, for selecting errors. It was used to be it was like thought out to be a way to like help like, you know, the people to actually select the arrows properly, but then it became like a trick the players like explored it to actually do better, you know, at the game. So, you know, it turned out like in those ways. So there wasn't like, just to recap, like we didn't really uh, did like a very intense thinking about like where to place, like the UIs, we knew that we wanted to minimize it as much as possible and really just make it about like the action. And, and in fact, we, like the only kind of like UI augmentation we did, uh, were with the one that you see there, like the health plus, uh, like the selection of the, of the arrows. Thank you. Thanks. I have a follow-up question about the haptics. Yeah. Um, so uh, did you design them as audio waveforms that are parameterized so that they change procedurally, or did you do something else for that? Uh, no, I wanted to design them as sound waves. Uh, there was no time for that. Uh, so I, I designed them as uh, kind of animation curves. That, mm -hmm. that they were just like bound between zero and one, so they were like normalized. But then you could 
add parameters to them to kind of change them in terms of like length, amplitude. So those are the kind of parameters that I was changing. So mm -hmm. um, probably there was like a better way to make it like more refined in terms of uh, active feedback. I'm pretty sure like if you talk to someone which is very expert or active feedback can tell you like a much better way to do it. Uh, like for me, from the point of view of the interaction design and the general UX, it was important to nail that concept of like rhythm. Like, when do we want to have them? At what point of the interaction we want to have them? And, and it's like what types of active feedback we want to have, there, how long it is, how intense it is, as I said before, like to classify them into, mm -hmm. uh, in, into things. But, you know, I was like really keen to actually try the sound waves and mm -hmm. see what would come out of it. I don't know, I don't even know if the like controllers that we have, mm -hmm. uh, like at the moment, are actually uh, like responding very deeply to this kind of like you know, sine wave optics. Yeah, not, so I was actually sure about wondering it. about that too because I've been struggling with the same kinds of things in right. optics right now. Um, and uh, Oculus controllers versus like the um, uh, the Vive controllers have right. like very different haptic profiles. Yeah, so very did you, different. Like, did you like do custom curves for both of those? And like, do you actually have like amplitude up and down kinds of stuff in your animation curves? Because if you just drive a single animation curve, it doesn't really feel like anything, at least in the experiments yeah. I've done. We, we, did, we did, like mostly they are the same, like, like haptic curves, let's call them that way. Mostly they are the same, but in a few occasions I remember we have to actually make them different for platforms. Mm -hmm. So because like the vibe is very different. The Oculus was much better from this point of view. Mm -hmm. it, like give you a much better response. It, also like in terms of kind of like identifying a different type of optic, you know, in terms of like uh, you know, how long was the optic click mm -hmm. or the intensity of it. Uh, that really was better. Um, but yeah, all in all, we actually kind of like moved kind of carefully around it because we didn't want to overdo it, but also like we didn't know how far we could go with the platforms we are in. So we, like, we took it like little by little, um, adding like, you know, little by little uh, every now and then and see like if it was improving. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bill. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk, by the way. Oh, yeah. yeah. Hi. <laughs> um, so I found it really interesting. You know, you mentioned the remote user research. I found it really uh, interesting how you're able to get your users to collaborate within, you know, the the you know their group. Can you talk to how you were able to set that up and how you found the users, how you facilitated the the channel? Yeah. Uh, about the collaboration, I have to say we were lucky. We, they were just talking. They were out of passion. They were just talking out by themselves. We set it up as um, internal beta testers. Officially, they were internal beta testers. Uh, and, but then I recruited them into like, the like, user testing of the crossbow. The way we did it was like, simply by releasing the prototype of the crossbow into the game. And, and tell them, like, OK, that's a new thing. Like, just go, like, go wide with it. Uh, we did not anticipate anything, really. I wanted to get like, the most kind of like, pure, in a sense, environment possible. And, um, and then what we did uh, was like, we, we didn't really think that through because I, I wasn't even thinking that was like a good idea to do it remotely. But like what we did was like just to have a channel on Slack yeah. and they were like talking, they, yeah. they were like in the channel and they were like talking out each other like in the channel and they allowed me to listen a lot. They were like talking so much and they were like typing so much. How many I basically people was able to actually, How many people? Yeah. We got like, uh, I think it was like four or five beta testers oh, wow. uh, on board. And, and they were like, you know, by the time they got into, into the beta testing, they already had like hundreds of hours on the shoulder. So they were really, really, like, like they really had built like a lot of muscle memory for the bow. Yeah. So the beginning was like, like we did something crazy, like we switched uh, a teleportation like device from one end to another one and they couldn't play the game anymore. Uh, so that was like the thing that we did, but then I have to say very, very important was to actually get the video playback from them, like, like the video recording yeah. to send them on Slack. And just like to send them on Slack and then like kind of like organize as a forum, like free to comment on it. And that was giving me a lot of in, like information in the back lines. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks, man.